يشاء بغير حساب فتقبل صدق الله العظيم نحمده ونسلي ونسلم على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا ومولانا محمد صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم رسوله النبي الأمين المكين الحنين الكريم الرؤوف الرحيم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله تعالى في شأن حبيبه إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد كما تحب وترضى بان تصلي عليه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا اهل الكتاب تعالوا الى كلمه سواء بيننا وبينكم الا نعبد الا الله ولا نشرك به شيئا ولا يتخذ بعضنا بعضا اربابا من دون الله فان تولوا فقولوا اشهدوا بانا مسلمون صدق الله العظيم وبلغنا رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين most respected علماء my respected elders brothers and sisters in islam assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh this past week so a very famous pop star or cat yusuf islam stevens coming to the shores of south africa and had a few concerts in johannesburg and in cape town and durban and all of these concerts were sold out i think there were two in johannesburg two in cape town and i think one in durban the average attendance of people at his rock concert were about 8 or so thousand in johannesburg and similar in cape town and about 4 to 5 thousand in durban typically with us ultra conservative muslims in this country there were a lot of bruha on social media in terms of how haram yusuf islam's concerts are and how haram is the participation in yusuf islam's concerts and how haram period music is considering that prophets abhorred music etc etc forgetting that there are two concrete legitimate views on the issue of the permissibility of music in islam 
the ultra conservatives typically went on on a rampage, you know, a rampage in terms of denigrating those people who have an alternative view, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, calling them misguided, wagara, wagara. The typical, the typical South African Muslim ultra conservative. Nothing new, nothing to get you know irritated or you know have your feathers ruffled about. But again. The issue wasn't about the permissibility of music or the halalness or the haramness of Yusuf Islam's concert or anything. But what I want to discuss today is a very important issue which came about and which, which has been a bit of a bugbear of mine for a period of time now. And that was that Yusuf Islam came. Whatever his views are in terms of Islam, his music, and the, the wisdom behind him engaging in this type of music once again and so on, that's his personal issue. And I don't want to get into that matter as well. What I want to discuss is the fact that in one concert and two in Johannesburg and two subsequently in Cape Town, which plus minus 16, 16,000, uh, 68, 16, 32, 30, about 35,000 people. Me and mathematics, you're not good. Okay, About 35,000 pe people attended his concert. Almost 95 to 97% of them being people of other faiths. I saw a small clip this morning wherein he spoke about, uh, on the stage, I think in ICC here in Durban, where he spoke about his journey to Allah. He spoke about his journey to Allah in 1975, how he almost drowned and he pleaded to Almighty Allah to save him, etc., 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 unless there's some other God out there, but we know there's only one Allah. He pleaded to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to safeguard him and so on there, and thereafter he was given a book. Without mentioning the Holy Quran, he went on, on stage in front of 4,000 people, and I think he did the very same thing in Cape Town, wherein he read from the Holy Quran without having mentioned it. Without having said much about Islam, or propagating Islam, or actively engaging in da'wah. If everything else was a complete failure, if everything else was completely haram, if everything else was completely impermissible, because Islam looks at everything with the glass half full and not with the glass half empty, at the very least, 97% of that audience who may have not had any positive exposure about Islam before were exposed to Islam through one quotation of the Holy Quran and through one example of a Muslim in the form of a person that they can identify with racially, that they can identify with religiously, that they can identify with culturally. And in one statement of one recitation of the verse of the Holy Quran, and just by Yusuf Islam standing there, a message was sent out to plus minus 35,000 people that hold on, Muslims are all not terrorists. Islam is not a religion of war. Islam is not a religion of hatred. Islam facilitates and is open to culture. Even white people accept Islam. And not stupid white people, pop stars, rock stars, find guidance in Islam. Without even having said a sentence. If that is not positive, and if we see no positivity in all of this, then I want to take you to the next question. And that question is, how much has the Muslim community locally, or for that matter, globally, done with regards to da'wah, particularly to the white people? <coughs> have you thought about that? White people. White people are free from da'wah. White people are exempt from da'wah in this country and internationally for that matter. Do you know that? They're exempt from it. You want to see how? You look at read our local newspapers, whether it's Al-Qalam, Muslim Views, or whatever it is. I saw one article this morning, a mashallah, and a dawah organization called a Saudi scholar to do a workshop in, in, in KwaZulu, Natal, with regards to dawah strategies, how to invite people to Islam, etc., etc., etc. Who are the people being invited to? Who are the majority of the participants? Local African Muslims. Was there any white man there? No. Where is the dawah concentrated? Almost 99.9% .9 recurring in this country. Where is dawah concentrated? In the Hindu communities? Amongst the Khalids? Amongst the whites? Amongst the Africans only? 
Why? Did you ever think about that? Why? Why are, are the Hindus and the Tamils not worthy of our da'wah? Are they immune to da'wah? Are they exempt from da'wah? Just last week, I was on my way from through Sparks Road, and there's a, there's a church in Sparks Road, and they had to ha happen to have a massive church meeting. And it was the middle of the week. I think it was a Thursday. Right? And as I was passing through, you see all of the droves of people, Indian, Tamil, ex-Tamil, ex-Hindus, walking out of the church. Not one, not 10, not 20, not 50, not 100, uh, hundreds. And I was amazed and I was quite surprised at the number of people walking out of one church who were people of Indian origin. Why is our da'wah in particular in this country, and for that matter, only focus on the African Muslims? Why not da'wah to the whites? Is it because we regard ourselves or we may feel that we are intellectually incompetent to do da'wah to them? Perhaps. Perhaps. I think we are. We feel that. Is it because we feel the effects of colonialization and apartheid till today in this country? Right? Therefore, we feel and regard them as being superior? Possibly. Is it because they have been recognized in this country in particular as belonging to the highest socio-economic strata of society that we don't engage in da'wah with them? Is it because it's easier for us to try and convert the local indigenous population because of their lower socio-economic status which makes them more susceptible and more uh, inclined towards another deen because it may bring them some degree of economic relief. And we can't do any of these things to the white people in particular. Right? If you are going to say, no, no, the Dawah challenge, oh, oh, hold on a minute. The Dawah challenges are greater in the African Muslim community because we know very little in terms of their language. Very few Dawah and unless they are born African, know the language of the local African population, number one. Number two, very few du'at know anything about the culture of the African people unless they themselves are African. Yet we, as Indian Muslims, yet we as Muslims in general, locally and globally, do we have a problem with the language? What am I speaking in? Zulu? Koza? Hindi, Tamil, Telugu, Afrikaans, I'm speaking English. Is a lingua franca. Now tell me something. What's the problem? Is it because we're intellectually competent? Is it because of the socio-economic conditions? Is it because of the effects of colonialism? Yeah, they all contribute to it. But let me tell you the biggest problem. We regard ourselves and we've been made to feel culturally inferior to white people culturally inferior to white people because they have imposed their culture locally and globally to such a degree that what Richard Dyer, he wrote a book called White and in this White he said, he said that the greatest uh, remarkable achievement of the white people is their invisibility. The white people are the benchmark. Everybody else is black, brown, yellow, Chinese, this, Indian, the rest of them are all white. And I'll give a quotation for you from his book, brilliant quotation, which, is, which serves as the premise for his book. He says, white people create the dominant images of the world. Right? Your clothing? Curated by whom? Anna Wintour. Vogue, if you didn't know that. Right? Your, 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 your cars, designed by whom? The Germans. Your watches by the Swiss, the dominant culture, food, this, whatever it is. Who is it by? The whites. So what happens? They create the dominant images of the world and don't quite see that they construct the world in their image. Brilliant line. The whites don't see that they construct the world in their image. So whatever you're reading, whether it's your newspaper, whether it's social media, whether it's Facebook, whether it's uh, you know, any of these other, you know, whatever it is, the movies and so on, all of them are taken from the given benchmark, which is the benchmark of the white man. 
That's the problem. I don't want to discuss whiteness. That's going to be another discussion altogether. But it brings us back to this point that, that fundamentally and essentially we regard ourselves as culturally inferior. Therefore, we will not actively engage in da'wah. Give you a case in point. Ask you, I'll ask you how many ulama there are in our Darul rooms right now who are white. How many Mawlana's do we have who are white? With the exception of, I think, one uh, good friend of mine, Sheikh Riyad Walls in Cape Town, who is a white revert and he's an alim. I don't think of, I haven't heard recently of any other white alims. One. Secondly, how many times have you heard any of our local and global da'is and du'at engaging in active da'wah in communities who are predominantly white? You heard of people going out there and engaging in da'wah. You know, like be going to the townships to do da'wah. You heard of anybody going to say, I'm going to do da'wah in Santon. Where, 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 where in Santon? Oh, I'm going to the JSC. I'm going to the JSC. And after that, I'm going to do lunch at, at Michelangelo. Right? And what are we doing? Oh, we're having a session in, in, you know, in Michelangelo when we're going to invite people to Islam. You ever heard of something like that? No. Why? 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 Are they not worthy of our da'wah? Where are you going to? I, I, I don't mind. I, I'm offering my, you know, my services. You know, 12 apostles and those area Clifton and so on. There. I mean, if you put up a masjid there, I, I'm volunteering my services. Constant Chateau is fine. It's okay. <laughs> right? Why? We can't do da'wah to them. Why? Because it's the color of their skin. It's the color of their skin. Do you know who these people are? These people are our coloni colonializers. We can't speak to them either. Why? Is our Islam any inferior? Are they not worthy of our Islam? Only the Africans are worthy of our Islam. Only the Tamils are worthy of our Islam. Only the Hindus are worthy. Whites of people are not worthy of Islam. That's one challenge. I don't want to go into all of them. Right? Second one is that the issue is that when you see how whites have entered into Islam, whether it's in this country or whether it's globally, you will see that it has been done through minimal dawah on, by the Muslims which shows that it's a global problem. There was a study done in Cambridge University by the Cambridge Islamic Society, and they, they, they pulled a whole lot of Af uh, white Muslims and so on as to how they entered into Islam. So they will tell you we entered into Islam through our exposure to Islam through architecture, or through music, or through art, or through love, or through friendship, or through you know, logical reasoning and so on, and a study of religion, etc., etc., etc. Right? That's how we accepted Islam. Very few people will tell you that they entered into the fall of Islam by virtue of someone enga engaging in active da'wah with them. Why? Because we don't have currently the da'wah tools locally and globally to be able to do that with them. Because we don't know how to engage with them. We don't know what their religion is. We don't know what their thinking is. We don't know what liberalism is. It requires us to go back to university. Leave our Darul Ulooms after becoming Molvis and Molanas after six years and then go to Cambridge. Go to their universities. Go to Cambridge. Go to Oxford. Go to Harvard. Go to, to, to some of the other, other you know, Yale and whatever it is. And go there and go study their religion, their way of thinking, which we haven't done. That's why we can't bring them to us because we don't know what drives them, what, 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 you know, what, what inspires them in terms of their thinking and their outlook in life. We don't know that. I'm giving you just the reasons and the problems right now. I don't want to go into each one is a discussion on the old. The third thing is that we have one more issue. Is that because of our overwhelming fascination with white people, and when I mean white people, I mean their culture in particular. We are so overawed and overcome by their culture that we have almost now, you know, homogenized into their culture. We are, we are cultural hybrids, right? This is our language. That's why I'm talking here in a masjid when I should have been talking in the Arabic, in the Islamic native language, which is Arabic. I'm speaking in English. And the, it is true, but my English is far better than my Arabic. Why? Because they have just, this, is, there is this cultural imposition on us. Now, what happens is the third issue. The third issue is this one, that once a white person enters into Islam, my word, it is as if, you know what, mana has, been, has descended from heaven. Really? A white person accepts Islam? Custom. I had one issue some years ago, a sister, a very, very, very good journalist, I must tell you, right, she had come here to the masjid, I won't take her name. She had come to the masjid once, so one guy phoned her, Hafiz, you know what, this, this, this female journalist, here, you know, she accepted Islam, can we give her about five minutes to, to talk about her journey to Islam? I said, no, when you find a black lady who also accepted Islam, then tell me about it then, then I'll get both of them to speak. He got the message and he put the phone down, right? 
What happens? We saw overall by one, one white accepting Islam that you will see that these people, depending on who got the market share, you know what, whether it was the Wahhabi Salafis or whether it was this group or that group who brought them into Islam, you will see they become poster boys for Islam. All of a sudden, with minimal education with regards to Islam, they are the guys out there who are on YouTube. They are guys out there who are speaking at conferences. They are the guys out there who just entered into Islam, who are teaching us born Muslims what Islam is. And preaching to us how great Islam is. Go on to the website and you'll see it. We had one local scholar. I don't know whether he's a scholar or I don't know him personally. I haven't heard any of his Some hablos, hub, hublos or so whatever it is. I don't know whether he's an alim or I'm not too sure. Allah alam. I think he is. I'm not too sure. Right? Why? What was the driving force? Besides the fact that he's got you know, the typical American style about them or the Australian style. You know that in your face type of discussion. I don't know. I haven't heard it. But, oh... The same, if you go to, to YouTube, you'll see some of the rivers to Islam, and some of them come here quite often, and they are fated, you know, look here, there's a river to Islam, and people rush there to, to talk to them. What for? What for? Have you discovered that? What's his education? What's his standard of education? Nothing. What is it? What's the attraction? Oh, he's white. He's white. So it gives us a sense of fulfillment that, you know what? Wow, a white person who's come from that you know, perspective of life has accepted our Islamic way. Subhanallah. <laughs> Do you understand? And then what happens? These people come with their, you know, little education and will sit down there and educate, and educate the Muslims. When what they should have been doing is going out there and educating those people of their own communities. So you see all of them in all of these Islamic conferences and these things here and whatever it is. Right? And then you'll see that what da'wah work are you doing amongst your own people? What strategies have you formulated? You come from the community, not interested. Why? It serves them better, they'll get a better audience with the Muslims than they would with their own people because they're too afraid to talk to their own people. Why? Once again, lack of education, but they'll get famous with the Muslims. The next challenge is that we have quite a few very, very accomplished scholars, especially go globally who have reached such a level with regards to their Islam that they are genuinely great Islamic thought leaders. There's no doubt about it. And they've done some brilliant work to a point where they have even eclipsed some of those Muslims who have been scholars and you know, things for years and so on. Right? And you see the impact of these speakers because they've managed to create that synthesis between tradition and what they were part of, which is what we would call modernity. And they've succeeded a great deal. They've captured audiences that are fundamentally Muslim because they've told them what Islam is all about. Right? But from a, from a very educated level. But they have been remiss with regards to their duties in actively engaging in da'wah with the different communities. They may say, and I've studied some of this, some of them say that, you know what, the methodology of engaging with wasps, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, Muslims, uh, Protestants of America. Remember, America is a Protestant America. The Protestants are regarded as the Kharijis amongst the Christians. So you'll see how, <laughs> you can see how uh, extremists they are in the ideology. And America is Protestant America, right? It's dealing with a very, very difficult mindset. And if they're not Protestant, then they subscribe to liberal values of, you know, what you talk about freedom, rights, human rights, liberty. All of these are all liberal freedom, liberal human rights, according to their prism of thinking. Right? But our du'at, locally and globally, haven't done anything about those issues. They haven't. And it's high time that we came to realize that Islam is for everybody. And that we are remissing our responsibilities with regards to da'wah and regards to all of these issues. Now, many people will, will sit and judge with regards to the mechanisms employed by some du'at in terms of bringing people to the fold of Islam. And this is where I want to bring you to your attention one issue, right? In the 1920s, and in recently in the 1970s and 80s, and also, yeah, in the 70s and 80s as well, there were some groups out there who belong to, they, look, there are various groups within Islam, various ideological groups within Islam. You have the Salafis, you'll have the Dilbandis, you'll have the Wahhabis, you'll have the Barelwis, you'll have the Ahl Hadith, you'll have 101. Fine. Each one of them is doing his or her work in their respective field. Each one of them has a branch which is dedicated to da'wah and they are bringing people to Islam. May they be rewarded for it. Great. But I want to show you one methodology which, is, which, which, which has an impact on what has happened recently with Yusuf Islam and everybody making a big fuss about it. 
In the 1920s, there was a man by the name of Sufi Inayat Khan who went to America. And not only did he go to America, he went to France, he went to Britain, he went to various parts of Europe. And he spoke about and he professed universal religion. He was a, you know, Quran, Sunnah, Muslim. But in terms of his da'wah, he invited and he laid out a great net with regards to bringing about the concept of universal religion, etc., 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 etc. For the years that he engaged in this type of da'wah, right, the impact was that lots of people entered into the fall of Islam. Some of them just took his spirituality, uh, the, the dimension of spirituality from him, and universal worship, etc., etc., and established their own temple. Fine. Fine. Leave that on one side. But the people who entered into Islam now for the past 80 to 90 years have been actively practicing proper Quran and Sunnah Islam with the communities growing day by day. The second example is that of Bawa Muhyuddin, who's buried in Philadelphia, New York I think it is, Philadelphia. Right? He was from Sri Lanka, speaking only Tamil. But he was such a man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that people wouldn't understand what he said. But the language of the heart translated into Iman for a whole lot of people. Till today, till today, his murids and his devotees and everything are all in Islam, all are Muslim. The same thing happened with the Turk, Muzaffar Ozak al-Jarrahi. When he went to America in those days, it was the heydays of the hippies and this and that and whatever it is. And he's, initially, he went out for a period of time speaking to people and bringing them to people. And people used to come into his gathering where he'd make dhikr and so on. And with the dhikr, with the duff and whatever it is, some people would dance and some people would take drugs and this and that and whatever it is. And he would have crowds of maybe three, four thousand people sometimes attending his programs. But towards the end of his life, he stopped. Because he needed to do what he do, you know, because he let out the bait. Now he wanted to reel them in. So he stopped one day and he said, Rao, all of you who know how to make wudu and perform salah, please remain behind. Those of you who can't do this, I think your session with me has come to an end. About out of the 4,000 or so, 1,500 remain behind. 1,500 or so, plus minus, remain behind. Which means that in those years of all of those people engaging, whatever haram activity was taking place, he still managed to bring in 1,500 people to the fall of Islam. To the fall of Islam. Now, unless and until we don't recognize and realize the culture of a people, don't know how these people think, don't give a little bit of latitude with regards to the practice of deen, it's going to be very difficult for us to shove, shove Islam down someone's throat. Islam was, was, was presented and propagated by the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in, in a slow, measured manner. Not all of the rules of Islam were implemented overnight. Never. Never happened. There was a problem when Alim was asked, a lady entered into the fall of Islam at his hands, and she, she asked him, Sheikh, you know what? I can't start, I can't read five times Salah. So, he said, okay, start off with two. Typically, the ultra-conservatives took one statement of his and said, see, this man is shaining Sharia, he's permitting her to only perform two rakats of salah and not make five. See the warped thinking. See the warped thinking. And the problem in this country, as well as globally, is the fact that many of these Muslims turn away from Islam after having entered into Islam because they don't find a degree of acceptability and don't find a degree of... of you know, commonality with the, with the local Muslims because they want to impose their culture on them, they want to impose their madhab on them, they want to impose their tariqah on them, they want to impose their aqidah on them, they want to impose their clothing on them, they want to impose everything. The guy said, I've lost my identity here, man. I've lost my identity. And the Prophet of Allah didn't come to destroy people's identity. He didn't come to destroy people's cultures. He came to inspire people. And he inspired them with, La ilaha illallah. There is no controversy, controversy in Islam with regards to the Shahada. There's no controversy in Islam with regards to Salah. There's no controversy in Islam with regards to Sawm and Zakat and Hajj. No controversy. Yeah, yeah, the way of Salah may be a little different. But it's still five times Salah. It's still five times Salah. You're still fasting in the month of Ramadan. You're still giving two and a half percent minimum in Zakah. 
You still supposed to do Malaysia Ta'ayin in Sabila Hajj once in a lifetime if you can. There's no controversy on those issues. Can we not just give them that? Really, can we just not give them that? And the other issue is that some of these whites who have entered into Islam, I'm talking about whites in particular, who have entered into Islam, have been radicalized. You may have read in the newspapers in recent years that you know, the terrorist attacks in Kenya, in the shopping center and so on, and they had South African links and wagara, wagara, and a few in, in America and so on, they were by white radicalist Muslims. You've got to ask yourself, why? Is it because of Islam? No. A Wall Street Journal carried an article, right? Are we seeing the radicalization of Islam, or are we seeing the Islamization of radicalization? Very important question. Very important question. Considering what has happened in the United States in the past two weeks or three or four weeks, right, you have to ask the question, is it the Islamization of radicalization, or is it radical, radicalization of Islam? Right? Many of these whites have spoken about the fact that when they've entered into Islam, they've been ostracized from their own communities. And women who have chosen to wear hijab, all of a sudden, are now looked down upon. They lose their white privilege when they enter into Islam, globally. But the still hasn't stopped them. And the sad part is that we who stand here and are judgmental about people who are doing da'wah and so on, have done nothing to invite people to deen. You've never met your white neighbor and spoken to them about deen. You've never invited them to a masjid. And you didn't, and you needed hikmah. Fine, go ahead, use your hikmah. Invite them for supper. Just inform them that this is what his halal meat is. It's the same as your lamb that you're going to have A, AAA grade lamb. It's fine. It's there to be said, Bismillah, Allah. But they understood the point. They're not going to have an issue with that. But what are we doing about it? And, and this is critical because in this country and globally, whether we do it or not, the deen of Islam doesn't belong to us. Allah says, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِذُونَ Till today, in spite of all the negative press about Islam, you see Islam is still the fastest growing religion. I checked up the latest statistics. It's still the fastest growing religion. And how much are we contributing to it? Not much, really. Ask the people in Norway, which da'i came to them? Ask them. Ask a guy in Scotland, there was an article in the Independent of UK, where he said, I became Muslim first, and I was introduced to, sorry, I, uh, I became Muslim first and I was introduced to Islam and the Muslim six months later. He said when he went to when Scotland, he bought a, the Quran from the local bookshop, he read through the whole thing there, he became Muslim, started practicing, you know, in Ramadan, etc. And then finally when he went there one day to the mosque in Scotland there, the guy looked at him, he said, Assalamu alaikum, I'm Muslim. The guy said, oh, really? They were like shocked. When you became Muslim? Who made you Muslim? Who made you Muslim? And all that they could do was they were so shocked, they, they, there's the keys to the mosque, you know, because they don't allow them, because it's a small, there's the keys if you're entering to the mosque. That was it. He said, thank God that I was exposed to Islam first and Muslims later. There were a few people, whites again, who used to come to my father. My father would keep them away from Muslims. He said, please, no. Come here once a week or once a month or whatever. Come here, sit here, talk to me, learn about Islam. I'll give you the things inside there, but do not expose your Islam and don't declare your Islam to, the, to fellow Muslims out there until you are ready. If he found that they were ready to be, you know, assimilating, the, then he would in, invite them into the community. When inviting Islam was done, now it was inviting them and assimilating into community. Some of these people have still maintained closet Muslims. Why? Because when they went into the Islam Muslim arena of this country, they realized there is so much of non-Islam among the Muslims that they better off being where they are. Really. These are the challenges Allah gave us Tawfiq and Hidayah and But really, we need to do something about this. Let us stop you know, being armchair critics and ask ourselves, what have we done? What have we done with our neighbors? What have we done with our, 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 our Tamil and Hindu and our Telugu friends? Why is it that the Christian missionaries and evangelists can do that degree of da'wah that they are converting to Christianity by the thousands? And we Muslims may have, may have had that neighbor or your, your, your colleague, or someone who works for you for years. And you know what chances are? They'll tell you, I'd rather not be Muslim. But thank you very much. What happened to that? Let us consider that first before we sit and criticize the whole dunya. Allah give us Yes, two things.